My name is Michael Wright. I am a program director for Peace Catalyst International, an evangelical Christian organization that seeks to promote greater understanding and edifying relationships between Christians and Muslims. Dr. Safi Kaskas joins me today. He and I share the goals for reconciliation between our two religions. Recently, Dr. Kaskas has organized the International Institute of Contemporary Quranic Research, which will be a forum for contemporary Islamic scholarship with the added goal of making this scholarship freely available online. Today we will talk about something called takia. Not long ago, I listened to a Christian preacher who defined takia in the following manner. It is the idea that Muslims can lie about their religion if such lies advance Islam. And he made the point that Christians cannot trust what Muslims tell them about common ground between Islam and Christianity because of this concept called taqiyya. I have some quotes here that kind of elaborate on this misunderstanding. You know, there's a website called billionbibles.com, and I quote, it should be emphasized that while lying is a cause for shame in the West, taqiyya isn't in Islam. To Muslims, taqiyya lying to infidels to advance and protect Islam is both a virtue and a duty. Uh, the Christian Science Monitor puts a political slant on this idea of taikia. And I quote them when they say, should the West trust Iranian promises? The short answer is no. But the underlying question is why not? The answer lies in the Iranian belief of, notably the doctrine of taqiyya, a difficult concept for many non-Muslims to grasp. Taqiyya is the Shiite religious rationale for concealment or dissimulation in political or worldly affairs. At one level, it means that the Iranian regime can tell themselves that they are obliged by their faith not to tell the truth. Christianity Today also comments about Taikia in this way, and I quote, some Christians today are comfortable delving into the conscience of everyday ordinary Muslims, finding a deception at every turn. The idea is called Taikia, that Muslims are permitted by their faith to lie if it will advance the cause of their religion. Tharwat Waba professor of, a mission at, of mission at the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Cairo, cited a tradition of Muhammad that allows Muslims three exceptions to lie for a greater cause, war, reconciliation, and to keep a wife happy. Uh, Dr. Koskis, you and I have had many conversations about the common ground that exists between Islam and Christianity. Yes. In my mind, if we, if, if we came, to, well, we have come to be good, good friends. Let me emphasize that. Yes. Can you imagine the disillusion I would experience if I came to understand that such deception or taqiyya was an integral part of our relationship? Let me hasten to say, however, I do not have any doubts about your integrity, my friend. So, Dr. Koskis, please enlighten us about the correct understanding of the, the concept of taqiyya. Well, Michael, I will start by telling you why this concept and many other concepts are spread now very widely in the United States, I should say. Uh, let's start with saying that according to many sources, more than 20,000 Americans converge to Islam every year. And many leaves, of course. This is post 9-11. Before 9-11, the figure was closer to 35,000 a year. This situation is conceived as dangerous by some people. In order to stop Islam from its continuous expansion, they invented these keywords such as jihad, 
Sharia, and Taqiyya. All this is in addition to the war on terror that aimed at demonizing all Muslims by calling them terrorists. Well, uh, given the mostly negative news reports that we see on television and, and that most non-Muslims have minimal contact with Muslims, I think it is understandable that non-Muslims would be easily convinced by such Islamophobic propaganda. With respect to Taikia, what is the correct meaning of this term? Uh, it's a ruling. It's not even in the Quran uh, in, in, in the sense that it's used at all. Uh, it's a ruling that permit a believer to conceal his or her faith when under threat of persecution or attack from forces hostile to Islam. And, uh, uh, you know, it's not, it's, it's not a central uh, belief or something uh, that Muslims are taught. I the first time I heard the word taqiyya is when a Christian who heard it in church came and asked me about it. So it's not something common at all. Can you give us some examples that illustrate the true meaning of the word taqiyya? Well, you all remember ISIS, the very fanatic organization that at one time uh, was fighting in the Middle East to take over the Middle East. This came after the invasion of Iraq. During the war against ISIS, a fanatic organization, of course, many Shia Muslims uh, claim to be Sunni Muslims to escape death. If you catch someone and say, are you Shia or Sunni? You say, I'm Sunni, because you know those guys that are threatening to kill him are Sunnis. Uh, many Yazidi women who are not Muslims claim to be Muslim to escape death. Uh, have you heard of Corey Ten Boom, for instance? I have heard of Tor Corey Ten Boom, sure. Well, Corey Ten Boom, along with her father and her sister, during World War II, uh, tried to save many uh, Jews' life by claiming, by, by lying, that uh, she's not hiding them or she doesn't know anything about them, when in fact, she was hiding them and helping them escape. So with that, is that taqiyya to save some, some innocent person's life? Let's talk about the Muslims who saved Jews from the Nazis in Albania. During World War II, Muslims in Kosovo and Albania saved many Jews from the Nazis in the German-occupied territories. They were following an ancient Albanian code of honor, which demands hospitality to strangers. We know welcoming a stranger is mentioned over 30 times in the Bible, even at the risk of one's life. Just Google it, you'll find it everywhere, Alba Albanian saving Jewish lives. Then you have uh, in Morocco during World War II, King Muhammad V stopped the Nazis short of er eradicating his Jewish community. Actually, he refused uh, to pass laws uh, against the Jews. He said, there are no Jewish citizens here. There are no Muslim citizens in Morocco. They are all Moroccans. Uh, you know, Jews today uh, in Israel and outside Israel know that uh, uh, King Muhammad V saved many, over 200,000 Jewish lives. And uh, they appreciate uh, what, what he did for them. Hmm. So what is the consequence, according to the Quran, for deceiving people about the truth of Islam? Well, the Quran teaches Muslims to be entirely honest and truthful when conveying the teachings of Islam. The Quran states that one of the greatest evil is for a person to lie about the teachings of Islam, inventing a lie against God. We will find this in Surah 39, verse 32. Let me tell you what the Quran says about this. So who is more unjust, the Quran says, than one who invents lie about God and denies the truth when it has come to him? Is there not enough room in hell for the unbelievers? So whoever lie about God, knowing the truth, but still lie, 
is called an unbeliever here. Even he claimed to be a Muslim. He who promotes the truth and testify to it, it is they who are mindful of God. They will have with their Lord whatever they desire. This is the reward for those who do good, that God may remove from them the worst of their deeds and reward them according to the best of what they have done. Well, in these verses, uh, it's very clear that Islam does not uh, propagate that a Muslim lies about his religion for any reasons. Lying is not encouraged in Islam. Are there any Christian influential Christian leaders who present a more accurate understanding of the word taqiyya? There are many. One of them you already know, my late friend Rick Love, who founded uh, your organization. He, he, knew, he knew Muslims all over the world. He spent half of his life in Indonesia as a missionary. He knew Muslims intimately. And he, reject, he rejected that, uh, uh, that accusation about Muslims uh, when it was propagated among various churches and churchgoers. Uh, here's another one. I will give you an example of my friend, Marta Akkad, the head of the Arab Baptist Theological Seminary. He wrote an article about this hideous accusation against Muslim and said, you may ask what business I have in defending Muslims against the accusation of taqiyya. For indeed, communicating false information and deceit, whether with good or bad intention, is not a familiar practice, nor it is sanctioned from the perspective of a New Testament worldview. My explanation of the concept of taqiyya in defense of Muslims is to guard us against bearing false witness. Would, would it not represent taqiyya on our part to use a Muslim belief against Islam and Muslim by promoting a partial understanding of it? Are not those who dissimulate the, the true meaning of taqiyya, practicing the very doctrine which they claim to be exposing, judging Islam and all Muslims through a partial understanding of a Muslim doctrine for the pur purpose of inciting others against Islam is never justifiable for a follower of Christ, the prince of peace, the reconciler of our world. This is what Martin Akkad said. So, how can Christians come to trust that Muslims have no motive to use deception that, when they're talking about their faith? Well, Michael, suppose a Muslim is having a conversation with a Christian, and the Muslim is making everything about Islam looks good. What will happen next? Will, will the Christian be convinced to become a Muslim? And what happened next? <laughs> Might he discover the truth about Islam that the Muslim was trying to hide and, uh, uh, and, and leave Islam? I mean, the whole accusation is silly to tell the Christians that Muslims lie about their religion. Aren't the Muslims smart enough to think for themselves when they're talking to a Muslim, whether this guy is telling me the truth or lying to me? And suppose I believe them. Are they going to tie me to a pole inside the mosque? and prevent me from leaving? Well, when, the, when I discover he's lying, I'll just uh, kick him out uh, of my house or my office or my church and uh, go about my life the way it used to be. So the whole accusation is silly. It's designed simply to discourage Christian from trusting, from trusting Muslim. They're all liars. So Jesus said to love your neighbor. He did not say distrust him or accuse him of deception. Christians who are interested to know the truth should invite their Muslim neighbors into their homes and communities of faith by practicing Christian hospitality. Most mosques in the United States will be glad to receive anyone and to explain their faith to them. There is no substitute to get to know your Muslim neighbor for yourself. Meet a Muslim if you are interested in knowing the truth. Let me just share with you 
uh, what the Quran teaches Muslim and other, and let you decide for yourself who is lying to whom. In, the, in this Quran passage, God is teaching his prophet Muhammad and saying, had your Lord willed, all the people on earth would have believed. All of them entirely. Is it then up to you, prophet, to compel people to believe? He's telling him to take it easy. Don't even try too hard. It's for you, prophet, to uh, talk to them about the revelation I'm giving you. And it's up to me to guide them to real faith. So don't get overexcited trying to convince people. Take it easy. God also says in the Quran, and say, the truth is from your Lord. Whoever wills, let him believe. And whoever wills, let him deny the truth. You know, at the end, we, were all, we will all go and stand in front of God. We can't lie to him. He knows the truth. He knows the truth of our heart. He knows what's in our heart. So it's up for him to judge at the end. In my opinion, this invention called taqiyya is a very silly invention. People, if they want to hurt Islam and Muslim, maybe should find something smarter to say about Islam and Muslims. This is all I have to say about this subject, Michael. Well, as I said earlier, the word taqiyya was used recently actually by a visiting preacher in my own church. He used the word taqiyya as a bigoted slur against my Muslim friends. I have informed my pastor that the visiting preacher's comments, including the use of the word taqiyya, were deceptive. Jesus taught that before we try to remove a splinter from our brother's eye, we must first remove the plank that is in our own eye. And to deceive to deceive a, a, a congregation in a church uh, in that manner is certainly a plank in uh, that preacher's eye. I agree with the Apostle Paul who said in Acts 10 verses 34 to 35, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Thank you, Dr. Koskis, for joining with me today. To you who have listened to our conversation, I encourage you to visit www.koskis.com. The name is very easy to spell. It is simply K-A-S-K-A-S. -A -A Among other good things, the website will show you how to acquire a copy of Dr. Koskis's translation of the Quran into modern English that is uh, easily read and understood by English speakers. I also encourage you to read my novel, A Divine Wink, When Love and Religion Become Rivals. In the novel, Adila, a devout Muslim woman, falls in love with Martin, a devout Christian man, and their love struggles to survive opposition from their families and their separate, unsympathetic religions. I think you will be pleased to learn how Martin and Adila deal with this opposition and, more importantly, how they come to discover the extraordinary common truths between Islam and Christianity that make their relationship both edifying and possible. Please go to www.adivinewink.com to make this novel a part of your life. While there, you will also find a link to Peace Catalyst, International, which will give you an opportunity to financially support our important work. Please do help us. Thank you.